Just back in my, my days, my days. Ethan Senkus was 19 when he tried heroin for the first time. Me and my dog, cared about my dog. My dog and getting high, two things I cared about. By the age of 23, it had almost ruined him. And I was just broke, 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 broke. And I'm just tired of living the way I was living. When he checked himself into this drug treatment center in Texas, Ethan knew that getting clean would be hard work. But soon, he'd be introduced to a new concept, work-based therapy. The workload, and they, they, it's all about work. These men also ended up in rehab, seeking treatment for addictions that had taken over their lives. But their treatment plans were soon dominated by long hours working for private corporations. It was a Walmart distribution center. So all I did was unload cargo containers. They said, you need to give me a day off because I can't do this anymore. They worked these jobs without pay. Uh, very demeaning. It's hard to describe where you're going to work every day. And at the end of the week, you have nothing to show for it. And they labored in dangerous conditions. My whole life flashed before my eyes. I thought I was dead. I really did. I thought my life was over. When I hit the ground, it basically knocked the wind clean out of me. You know, it's what they call work therapy. What is work therapy? Is there such a thing? They say you work to pay for your treatment. But it wasn't really a lot of treatment. So often, people go into these programs, they're exploited for their labor, they're injured, they're made to feel expendable. This has been going on for a long time and no one's really paid attention. When these two reporters began asking questions about work-based therapy, they uncovered a national trend. So the whole thing's called all work, no pay. Right, all work, no pay. In the midst of an American drug epidemic, they've found high demand for low-cost rehab and a set of labor practices that might be illegal. People just didn't have enough time to get the required hours of counseling because work came first. These are the stories of four men who were told that work would help them beat their addictions. In this collaboration with Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting, Fault Lines finds out what happened to them instead. That place was all about manipulation and greed. For five decades, a nonprofit called the Senecor Foundation has made a promise to people seeking help with serious addictions. Not long ago, I was lost, lost in my addiction. My life was spinning out of control. Check into one of Senecor's three long-term rehab centers in Texas and Louisiana and work a job to pay for your treatment. But then I found Senecor. With treatments tailored to me, that truly worked. With the counseling I needed. Senecor Two years later, you can walk away clean is. and sober. Senecor can help you right now. They make it out to be a sweet deal until you get there, until you, until you get your mind right. After you get there and you get a little clean time and you're starting to think straight again, then, you're, now, then you start to think, well, you know, this is kind of a shady deal here we got going on. When he entered the program in 2013, Ethan Senkus agreed to work without a paycheck. Do you remember signing this? Yeah. Resident received no monetary compensation for assigned responsibilities in the facility. All funds received go directly back to the foundation to help offset the cost of treatment services. Oh, signature's right here. Soon, his days were spent cutting wood at this sawmill outside of Houston called Skid and Pallet. I remember I would come in and see my load for the day, and you know, it would be a bunch of pallets full of wood, so I would hurry up and get it all through, done in, and I'd be done by one o'clock and they'd bring more and set them down. Go ahead and start on these. Anybody's gonna get tired of working for a year straight and not getting a dime of it, you know? Senecor clients work unpaid jobs at private companies for 18 months. If they graduate the program, they can be hired on as paid employees. But the problem is, the majority of the people leave around a year. They'll make it that long, work for free that long, and then get mad and tired and leave the program. So it's like they just, they're constantly getting a year of work, a year, 10 months, free work from people, and then they turn around and leave it. 
In the last five years, Senecor's partnership with more than 300 private companies generated about $36 million, making it one of the largest and most lucrative work-based rehab programs in the country. In a written statement, Senecor told us that work has therapeutic value for clients. Ethan says his job left little time for actual therapy sessions. I mean, I, the whole time I was there, I could probably count on both my hands how many times I went to group. They need to lighten up on the work and focus more on, like, recovery. Reporters Amy Julia Harris and Shoshana Walter have documented similar stories from about 100 former Senecor clients. Now, their investigation has turned to the accounts of former staff. Hello? Hi, is this Andrea? Yes. After nearly three years as a counselor at Senecor's Baton Rouge facility, Andrea Brooks left her job in 2018. One thing after another, you just kind of sit there and shook your head. I'm curious what role you think work plays in recovery and what that ratio should be to counseling. Because for the most part, if they worked at the plants or some of them other places, they did work extremely long hours. And no, they didn't have the counseling because they were at work. I spent actually more time helping the clients cope with being there versus dealing with the issue of what brought them there in the first place. Wow. So in staff meetings, we would raise the question, they're working too much. And he said they did not work that much. Now, we heard that from the client, so we wanted to know for a fact. Peggy Billado also worked at the Baton Rouge facility as a clinical director. During a year at Senecor, she became concerned that work was getting in the way of her client's recovery. Did other counselors there have the same concerns as you? Every one of them did. Every time the issue was brought up, they would deny and say, no, they're not working those amount of hours. We would say it again. They would deny it, deny it, and then we just made up the spreadsheet to show the proof. At a staff meeting, Peggy presented Senecor managers with a document. It revealed that some clients were working 12-hour days, seven days a week. It was gratifying to slide the, the spreadsheet across with the data, the hard data. So you so, had kind of proof mm -hmm. of what you were saying. Yeah. I was disappointed that we saw the facts, the facts were delivered, the facts were not acted on. That's what I was disappointed about. And so I was hope that we had could have made a difference where we could give them a more solid foundation to move forward on. But it was not, it was not. It just kind of fell on deaf ears. Outside the Baton Rouge facility, the long work days continue. It's just after dawn, and these white vans are shuttling Senecor clients to jobs. Many will end up inside the oil and gas industry, some of the most dangerous workplaces in America. In 2014, Alistair Williams was working at a chemical plant called Formosa Plastics. The job building scaffolds put him 70 feet in the air. There's the scar right there. I was cut from here to here. On a rainy day, Alistair slipped and fell, shattering his knee. My kneecap was literally on the side of my leg. I'm in really excruciating pain. I'm crying, I'm cursing, I'm fussing. You know, please get me to the hospital. Half of the jobs you had no training to do. Half of the jobs were very dangerous. You know, people went on jobs where they had no experience at all. You know, it's like walking out in, into the real world and just looking around and just be lost. You don't know which direction to go in. After surgery, Alistair had months of recovery from the fall. So I had to learn how to walk all over again. That's when Senecor officials called him into a meeting. They gave me an ultimatum. You know, either get a job or get the step in. It's one of the two. That's what I was, I was faced with. Get a job or get the step in. Get a job or leave? Yes, sir. For Ethan Evers, the choices were even more stark. He could work long hours for a subcontractor at this Walmart warehouse or face prison time. 
Or were you ever worried about, you know, saying uh, you need a break or complaining about the type of work that you could get kicked out of the program? Yeah, we've been told that several times. Told if what? you refuse to go to work, you're refusing to pay for your program, and therefore you can leave the program. About half of all Senecor clients are sent to rehab by a judge. That's what happened to Evers after he failed the drug test, violating his felony probation. I could ha go back to the judge and see if he wants to sentence me or what he wants to do, and more than likely he was going to sentence me. And so we were talking about three felonies. Um, I'm going away for a while. Um, or you said I can go to Senecor. Across the U.S., some defendants are being given the option of drug treatment instead of prison. You may be seated. Inside the Dallas criminal courts, Judge Ernest White says incarceration won't help people on his docket beat their addictions. Ready, Ms. B? We did lose um, one of our clients about a year and a half, two years ago, to a uh, uh, heroin overdose. So, so we try to uh, stay on top of the folks, particularly with the heroin. And Mr. Rodriguez. Judge White's special court program requires people to seek treatment, make regular visits to court, and stay clean. You, you didn't test positive for? Oh, no, that, yes, it did come back positive, right. but I didn't do any drugs. I'm, I'm not buying your story about how you tested positive, uh, but at that same token, I'm not uh, revoking your probation. This is your opportunity, your chance to get it together. All right, can I count on you for that? Yes, sir. If this man continues to fail drug tests, Judge White has options. He can lock him up, or he can send him to a treatment facility like Senecor. If you can't stay clean, it's going to be back to jail and it's going to be inpatient. Yes, sir. In a decade, Judge White has sent many people to live inside Senecor facilities. Mr. Knox, you have anything further? But there's more to the story of this court reform. The unpaid work programs that clients are sent to labor in might be illegal. They're facing the prospect of jail, they're addicted, they need treatment, they're desperate. And I would say they're being preyed upon because of that desperation, because of the position they find themselves. And uh, I think that, that the government broadly has an obligation to try to protect those people. During two decades at the Department of Labor, Michael Hancock oversaw investigations of companies that had failed to pay their workers. So does this mean that clients have signed their rights away? We showed him the waiver that clients sign when they enter Senecor. That sort of waiver is ineffective. This has no effect on whether or not they ought to be paid. So this doesn't give Senecor any protection in the courts? No, not for a minimum wage or overtime um, violation, no. They have to look at a different way to run their business operation other than merely absconding with the workers' uh, wages. That's not a viable business model for them. Turns out that's been the opinion of the U.S. Supreme Court for more than 30 years. The court ruled in 1985 that unpaid clients working at a nonprofit called the Alamo Foundation were actually employees deserving of a wage. The ruling has gotten more attention in the wake of Amy Julia and Shoshana's reporting. This case has been cited in other lawsuits that have been filed against work-based rehab programs that we've exposed. Um, saying that, look, there's Supreme Court precedent for this, that this type of model is illegal and a violation of federal labor law. Senate Court can deduct for certain costs, like room and board, lodging, but otherwise, Senate Court workers are supposed to be getting paid. We asked current officials at the Department of Labor if they'd investigated this practice. They declined to comment. Has Senate Court ever been investigated? this practice? Not by, Senecor has never been investigated as far as we know by the Labor Department for these practices. Senecor told us that its work programs comply with state and federal laws. After working for 43 days straight, Ethan Evers needed a day off. But asking for a break came with consequences. On his first day inside the facility in 2016, Evers discovered that Senecor used harsh disciplinary methods to keep clients in line. And as soon as we walked around the corner, there was an entire two rows of people that were all sitting in a chair, all up straight, and they, were, they all looked like this, and they are all frozen like that. And none of them moved and even looked at you when you walked down the hallway. And I thought, what the hell did 
I just walk into. You just, you got, sometimes you got grown men screaming in other grown men's face, and it's like, uh, to me, it was just, it was weird, you know? It was old school kind of thing where you tear the person down. Do you think, as a counselor, that's effective form of uh, therapy for a recovering addict? I don't, because that's to me is a shaming method, and I, I think shame is not a cure all. It's, it's not a cure all for anything. What surprised you most once you got there? Probably their disciplinary actions. Uh, I wasn't ready for none of that. Matthew Oates checked into Senecor in 2017, hoping to learn job skills while he battled an addiction to cocaine. He'd soon find out that Senecor used work assignments in a different way, as a form of punishment. Mentally, they get in your head. And it, it hurts. I mean, it, it messes with you. Oates had made a pledge to stop smoking when he entered rehab. When he got caught with cigarettes in the facility, he says Senecor sent him to trim trees at this Baton Rouge home. I didn't have any proper protection equipment, uh, no safety gear, no safety tie-offs, anything with me. They knew I was going to do tree work. Had I been informed, I would have brought some of this stuff. Oates fell from the top of a 20-foot ladder and broke his back. Now, he's suing Senecor. What was going through your mind when, when you hit the ground when you were injured? Ow. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I, at that particular time, I really don't know what was going through my mind. I was just hurting. You, you're wondering, are you going to be crippled? You know, are you going to be in pain for the rest of your life? You know, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to be able to work again? Ethan Senkus nearly sliced his thumb off while working at the sawmill. The saw blade went straight from the tip right here straight into my hand down this way. So it cut my whole hand in half, and the scar goes from here to here. So from those two points, that blade went straight up and down through there. He knew cutting wet wood with a rusty bandsaw was a bad idea. But I can't tell them no, you know what I mean? Because if I get fired, you go back to Senecor, and you could get kicked people out for getting fired, you know? Senecor will kick people out for getting absolutely, fired? Absolutely, absolutely, they will fire, yeah. So you're punished for being injured? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Senkis was not kicked out after his injury. Instead, he says he was disciplined for getting hurt. His punishment? More work assignments inside the Senecor facility. Because I was in a, in a cast like this, Spraying down dishes and like stacking them up, you know what I mean? Just thinking in my head, you know, this is bullshit, you know? But yeah, absolutely. They had me working. They had me walking down the halls with one hand and a broom, broom in it, yeah. The injuries these men sustained at Senecor are not isolated incidents. In the last decade, around two dozen Senecor clients have been seriously injured on the job according to interviews and these public records. Fracture, breaking a bone or cartilage, employee was working with a mandrel and fell, the injured body part, low back area, twisted over pallet, a sprain of the ankle, nature of injury, amputation, fingers other than the thumb, fingers pinched between steel, resulting in both hands getting caught in the brake press, crushing of multiple upper extremities, Others. strain on the low back area, Intrusion. Bruise, intact skin surface. Employee was hooking up trailer and smashed hand. Nature of injury, laceration. Moving material with a dolly and was struck in the head by the dolly. Multiple head injuries and lacerations. Why did you choose to refer so many cases to Senecor over any other place? I've had a great deal of success, success with him. In his chambers, Judge White has awards for his support of Senecor. We wanted to know if he'd look into reports that clients were getting hurt once they arrived there. It was clear that the topic made him uncomfortable. How would you react if you found out that people in long-term treatment were being injured on the job? Um... <laughs> I mean... Uh, yeah. We've begun to hear several reports uh, from former clients uh, who've been injured while working long hours on the job. One person had his thumb. Uh, sawed in half, several people had their hands crushed in machinery, one man fell out, out of a tree, broke his back, another had to learn to walk again after a serious fall. Have you heard of these stories? I, I've, I've heard not of all those stories, 
um, but uh, I have heard of, of, of one injury. Um, and so obviously that's a concern um, 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 with that happening, with that taking place. Uh, but I'm not involved in that. Really answer your question, I think I would need more, more information on that regard. When we offered him more information, Judge White did not seem interested. Well, let me just show you, we, we have this stack well, of, I, of I workers' really, comp I, I don't want to get into that aspect, so, so I, I really want to talk about my program mm -hmm. um, and as far as the, the, the reports you have there and, and with their facilities, I, I would refer you to them. We tried to arrange an on-camera interview with Senecor officials. I'm unavailable at this time. Please leave your name, number, and a brief message, and I'll return your call as soon as possible. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Webb. My name is Sharif abdel Kudus. I'm a journalist with Fault Lines. And I'll return your call as soon as possible. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Webb. This is Sharif Kudus calling from Fault Lines again. I'm unavailable at this time. Please. No answer. Let's go over there. Finally, we decided to stop by their headquarters in Houston. In a written response to our questions, Senecor said that confidentiality laws prevent them from discussing specific cases. So I'll answer the door here. And uh, clearly, there are people inside. The nonprofit did defend its disciplinary tactics, saying its approach can help clients build self esteem. No one's going to answer us. They don't want to talk. Most of the companies we contacted declined to comment. But Walmart pledged to investigate what it called troubling allegations of unpaid labor in its supply chain. Senecor also told us that its work programs can provide clients a career path. For the 8% of its participants who graduate, that can be true. But for these men, Senecor took a lasting toll. While they continue to recover from addictions, they say they're also still recovering from rehab. I'm sober today. And it's Nothing to do with Senecor. Nothing. You know, I'm, I'm telling you this because I have to get this stuff out of me. I can't keep this bottled up inside of me. You know, the mistreatment that I got, you know, the, the mistreatment that I saw other people get, you know, I can't keep that with me. That's old baggage. What would you say to someone who is thinking of entering the program? You better think about the decision that you're making. Don't make no sudden, sudden decisions. You better read the reviews. You better talk to people who've been there. Ethan Evers finished the Senecor program with flying colors, and he used his graduation speech to give Senecor officials a piece of his mind. Yeah, I'm grateful that I experienced, quite honestly, the worst imaginable place that I've ever been to and would ever care to go to again. Because it just made me realize that everything else just sucks a little less. Ethan Senkis did not finish the Senecor program. Today, he says it's his family that keeps him focused on staying clean. And I mean, granted, it's better than prison, but if you're trying to go for actual help for a drug problem, you're not going to get it there. I've never been in a situation where, like, I felt so little of a person. I was nothing. We were all nothing. That's what they tell you.